Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Orenco Church and to our online worship this morning. Uh, we have a few announcements as we're getting started. And uh, Cindy Wasmer, who is our mission elder, has an announcement about Operation Christian Child. Hi, everybody. It's that time again for shoe boxes. We have a few of these empty boxes here at the church. First come, first serve, if you want to get a free one and fill it up. Um, also, they ask that you be sure to put your label and mark what age of a child, a boy or girl. This one happens to be a girl. And also, I ask that you put your shipping check on top of the box, on the outside of the box, so that uh, $9 per box. We'll be collecting these for a few weeks. You can check details in the newsletter. Um, also, they are saying this year, no liquids, not even toothpaste this time. So no candy, no liquids, any of that. Also, you can get details in the church office in the flyer that has these labels. And um, we're excited about this. It, it is a go. We were wondering if it was going to be with COVID, but it is a go. So thank you for your support. We look forward to seeing your boxes. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Cindy. Other announcements that we have uh, starting this week are going to be a number of uh, small groups. Again, you can check the newsletter for those uh, that you can sign up with. You can sign up with on uh, at the church office. I believe there are at least five of them getting going uh, this week and some next week as well. Uh, so be uh, aware of that, and we hope to see you there for those that are on Zoom. Uh, also, we're still collecting candy for our annual trunk or treat. This one, remember, is going to be a drive through uh, The guys have been ready, uh, getting some of the parking lot ready uh, for that already. Ready. That's coming up on the 24th of October between 3 o'clock and 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Also, uh, we want to uh, have your attention go to the giving page um, of the church website. Uh, your gifts help us do our ministry. It helps us uh, pay for uh, all that we want to do for our community as we seek to serve God. And, uh, and finally, we're looking forward to hearing from um, uh, Rachel again, as she is going to be in uh, segment four now of our uh, looking at Moses, his life, and, and how all of that plays out in the book of Exodus. So uh, join us now for worship. Uh, let's open with a word of prayer. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Lord, thank you that even um, in these odd times, our relationship with you is strong. Our relationship with you is secure. Uh, we have that, Lord, because of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, on this day, we gather to worship you. Uh, be in all that we do. Draw us to your word. Uh, speak uh, boldly through, through Rachel as she shares uh, from your word to us. And, Lord, may we, um, during this time together, be refreshed and renewed and then sent out to be your people. Thank you for Jesus Christ, who has made all of this possible. Your love to us. Uh, expressed through him, his life, his death, his resurrection. Lord, we love you, and we're glad to be here with you today. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Touching that 
I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see Good morning, boys and girls. Welcome to Sunday School. I am so glad that you are here with me today. Hey, last week I talked about us talking about superheroes. So I want to ask you a really quick question. What do you think the characteristics of a superhero might be? Well, I have a list, and maybe your list matches mine. It would be courage and friendship, compassion, patience, respect, and courage. Those are all things that a superhero might have. I want to read you a story, though, called The Story of the Good Samaritan. This um, story is Jesus told the story to the people. A man was going from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, they beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road when he saw the man. He passed by on the other side. A Levite also passed by on the other side. Okay, you ready? But when the Samaritan came and saw the man, he felt sorry for him and he bandaged his wounds. The Samaritan put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, the good Samaritan gave two silver coins to the innkeeper. Look after him. Um, I will pay you extra for his expenses. Jesus asked, which of these three was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? They listened and replied, the one who took care of him, Jesus said, Go and do likewise. So the amazing part about this story, boys and girls, is that there was a man who was a complete stranger that helped another stranger. So it's courage, and then he built a friendship. So I probably will not be here next week. I'm getting ready for our big event that's coming up on the October 24th, so I'm super excited. But I want to end today in prayer with you. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for this beautiful story that you have given us today. Help us to be a good Samaritan to someone that we may not know or neighbor close by us. We are so grateful that you live in our heart, and we thank you for everything that you have blessed us with. In Jesus' name, amen. Boys and girls, have a fabulous week, and we'll see you in a couple more. Bye for now. Bye. Good morning. It's great to see you again and be together for worship this day online. Let's pray together as we begin. Lord, thank you for drawing us to you uh, by your Holy Spirit. Thank you for uh, the technology in order to meet together on this day, your day. We pray, Lord, that um, we would sense your presence with us as we worship with our families now and as we, as we miss our church family and as we are apart from one another. And most of all today, Lord, we thank you for your word to us and that it reveals your son, Jesus Christ. 
Um, he is before all things and in him, all things hold together. And we are so thankful, especially during this difficult time. So we pray today as we consider your word and a kind of a familiar story to us in the next segment of, of course, Moses life, Lord, that you'd speak uh, very uh, specifically to each one of us today, clear our hearts and our minds and our, our concerns from, from the week and help us to listen for you. We pray together in Jesus' name. Amen. So it is good to be together again uh, on our computers, on our screens today, and to be back preaching. Um, and last week, we continued our exploration in this series on Moses' life and what we can learn from him and those different events. And I posed a question to all of you, and we're going to explore that a little bit more today. And the question was, how do we develop intimacy with God? So how how do we uh, grow closer to God? What does that look like? What do we, what do we do? And that's what we want to talk about today and just expand upon those answers that I gave you to that question last week. Now, we hope that you will join us after worship today for what we're calling Digging Deeper. And there's a link right below where you're watching on YouTube today. You just have to click on it. You don't even have to turn on your camera. Last week, we talked about the sermon. That's what we're doing each week. And one of you uh, defined intimacy with God for us. And you said, she said, it means God wants us to show up. And I thought that was the perfect definition of what we're talking about. God wants us to show up. And that's, that's exa exactly where we're going today as we consider the, the next part of uh, Moses' life together. So today we start seeing him show up. We left him at the burning bush, of course. Uh, you might remember that story from last week or go back and look at those other pieces of this series. And today, wow, today is just a great scripture. One of those ones we always remember and we get to look at over and over again. And Moses does some showing up. And we're going to elaborate uh, on those answers to that question I asked you. And I think it will serve us well. So if you're reading along with a Bible uh, there as you watch us today, we're going to be in chapter 32 of Exodus. And we're going to look at verses 1 to 6. And so as we find the prophet Moses today, he is actually up on Mount Sinai. You might remember from last week, which is the exact place where God had decided this was going to be the moment and spoke to him from this burning bush. And there was this big event. Many years later, we have fast forwarded you guys through like 27 chapters of Exodus um, to get to this week. Many years later, God is going to use Moses to lead the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt, of course, and to part the Red Sea and into the promised land and all of this good stuff. But first he's back at Mount Sinai and he's receiving instructions from the Lord, which will be called the law, considered the law. And this is, um, this is a set of instructions, a lengthy one about how to live with God, the father, how to live in covenant and in a relationship with him. And he's receiving that right now. So um, that's kind of the background where we begin. And we're at verse one. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, come make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. And Aaron, Moses' brother, he answered them, Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. And so all of the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. And then they said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day, the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterward, they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. Okay, again, I encourage you to go back and try to read all of these things that have happened. I know a few of you are reading through Exodus, maybe even for the first time, which is very exciting. After God calls to Moses and speaks to him through this burning bush event. And after so many years, as we talked about last week, Moses, after that time running away, he 
re-engages with God, which is exciting for us because it tells us that it's never too late to, to kind of have that uh, friendship with the one who made us. He decides to follow him. This part we didn't read. He packs up his family. Remember, he's gotten married and all that stuff, his kids. And he leaves Midian and he goes back to Egypt, which he has run away from. And you might remember all that, all that happened there. And his brother Aaron meets him. And just as God has explained in chapter three, that's exactly how these things unfold. Aaron meets him. The elders of Israel believe what Moses is going to say. And God's plan to deliver the Hebrew slaves is put into motion, just as God said that it would be. So Moses and Aaron, they go to Pharaoh and they do exactly what God commanded. You know, at least there's some of that in here. They perform, perform these wonders for Pharaoh and Pharaoh, whether he's impressed or not, doesn't really matter because God hardens his heart. And each of those times he does not let the Hebrew people go. And so here come the plagues and I'm going to let you read through uh, each of these plagues to catch up. But as the Israelites make their way, you know, out of this mess and out of Egypt, we read time and time again that God doesn't abandon them. Um, he is there to be with them. He leads them with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And they know exactly where they need to go. And they're pursued by the Egyptians and Pharaoh and the horses and the chariots and like everybody's there. And it's this crazy thing. And under Moses' leadership, believe it or not, after what we've said the last few weeks about Moses, under Moses' leadership as just a human being like you and I, and because of his faith, they don't stop and they keep going and God does deliver them. And so you guys have seen the movies, you know the story. Um, Moses, remember, he has his, his beard and he has his coat and his cloak or whatever, and he stretches his hands over the Red Sea and in the waters part and God delivers them through and here come the Egyptians and it closes right on top of them. Right. And they make it. And it's, it's pretty amazing as readers. We know they're going to be in the desert for 40 years. Um, but fortunately they don't know that. And they're in, they're in for a hard, just a hard time. Okay. So this is very fast. I know by chapter 19, they arrive at Sinai. That's what we read today. And this is this holy place where God has called Moses in the beginning. And what would happen is the people would stand at the foot of this mountain and um, Moses needed to commune with the Lord to understand, you know, to hear um, his direction. And he would go up the mountain and the Lord would then converse with him. And that's where Moses receives the 10 commandments. And I'm just going to read the first two. I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of Egypt. He's saying, who's doing this, right? Out of the land of slavery, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth below or in the waters below. And the Israelites agree there to live in covenant with God to follow their Lord. And so the next time Moses ascends the mountain, he speaks with God and he receives more pieces of the law, how to build the tabernacle and um, some instructions for worship and for the priests and so on and so forth. And God's given him these stone tablets. And the book of Exodus says these are written with the very finger of God. It says that this is this is uh, what the Lord has dictated to him. And while he's there getting all of this instruction of how to have this relationship with the Lord, who's done this for them, the people are down the mountain and that's what they're up to. The scripture that we read, they're up to no good. They're already breaking this uh, covenant and this relationship with God. For all of us, this pandemic officially, um, according to what I looked at, began on March 11th. I counted up the days and someone told me not to tell you the number of days because it, it sounded too, it sounds too overwhelming, doesn't it? Moses was only up that mountain for 40 days and 40 days. That's a pretty short time all of us here now in this situation of 40 days, that was enough for all of this to happen for them to come around Aaron, who was a priest. And I don't know if they pushed him around. I don't know if they, you know, pressured him, whatever they had to do. 
and Aaron gives in and they say to him, we need, you know, we don't know where Moses is. It, it's been too long. He hasn't been back and we need some other gods to follow. And they've already forgotten what has happened and what the Lord has done for them. They say, we know this Moses, love that part. We know this Moses brought us out of Egypt, but we're kind of, you know, we kind of just don't, we're just don't, we're not into it anymore. And so what does Moses' brother say? This is so shocking. If you haven't read Exodus, you seriously have to read some of the um, language and some of the responses in there. Of course, Moses is like, this is not what we expect from a priest, but here we are. He says, okay, <laughs> gather up um, your bling, like your earrings and your, you know, your bracelets and your necklace, whatever you all have, let's just gather it up. I don't know how they would have gathered it up, but it would have been a lot. And they probably pass around a basket. I don't know. As I said a couple weeks ago, um, from chapter two of Exodus, the apostle Paul tells us in the new Testament, be careful. You do not fall because <laughs> this is the exact, you know, example we need of how quickly things can escalate and we can make this kind of decision. The scripture I gave you at the time was first Corinthians 10, 12 to 14. And you need to look at it again, just write it down and read it um, at another time. The Apostle Paul uses this very story to talk about what God tries to warn us of, that we just, um, the making of idols and having gods before him, before our Lord. This is what this story is. These people are acting out for us today. And so Aaron, he gathers up all of this gold and he melts it. And it's likely he took time to build like this wooden structure thing of a calf. This is so horrifying. And he plates it in gold. And this all, this all would have taken some time, right? Everybody's like way into it because it's still going on. And there's no recording there of someone saying, you know what? I think maybe we should, we shouldn't, none of that's recorded for us. We don't really know how all this took place, but he shapes it all into a golden calf. And if that wasn't unbelievable enough, he, he's the priest. He presents the calf to the people and the people, it says, say these, these are the gods that led us out of Egypt. And they're like, right on, let's do it. And Aaron says, then we'll have a festival. We'll do it tomorrow. And that's what they do. So the next day they bring offerings to this calf and they celebrate and they don't celebrate Passover and the remembrance of what the Lord has done and delivered them out of Egypt. Instead, they bring their burnt offerings and various number of sacrifices to um, these new gods who were there. So the question is, how do we develop intimacy with God. And these are three things I gave you last week. We're going to repeat them and just elaborate on them. Number one was we make a decision. I mentioned a couple weeks ago to you, if you saw our video that we have a new puppy, his name is Scout. He's an Australian cattle dog um, slash pointer mix. Yes, we still have him. Everything's fine. Everything's going okay. By now he's five months old um, and he's great. I don't have pictures this time. I'm very sorry, but um, someday you all will meet him. That'll be fun. And I actually have been thinking about getting a dog for a very long time, but the timing wasn't right. And that's because I knew that it was a decision. We make a decision and keep a commitment. And so before we took on this thing, and he's, um, he's a medium dog, but what I didn't know is he's gigantic. <laughs> um, I didn't realize what will become a 50 pound dog is actually quite a, in my very limited zero experience is a big dog. He's going to be big, but you know, he's, he's big. Um, I knew this was a commitment. So before we did this, Brian and I both had a discussion with our kids about that and said, when we adopt a pet, um, this is a lifelong thing. We will have that dog and you know, we will have Scout for the rest of his life. We don't give him back. Um, we don't let somebody else have him because this is too hard. We don't do whatever because he's sick. We, we take care of him and love him. And this is a lifelong commitment. And now that we are about five weeks into this, you know, they see um, 
what I meant by that. They see the ramifications of that. This was a decision we made, and it's life-altering, of course. It's, you know, it's changed our lives every day to have a different routine in place, and he's wonderful. It's fine. Our God has created us for a relationship with him and also with one another. And that's what it means to be made in the image of God and God's design for each of those relationships, whether it was with our God, whether it's our relationships with one another, his design on those relationships is commitment. It doesn't say that right out, but it means it when we talk about God being love and how much God loves us. And the reason is that's the kind of commitment God made to us in Jesus Christ. And that's what he longs to have with us in return. So just as you commit to a lifelong pet um, or your spouse or your friend or your company, perhaps, or um, your child or any kind of relationship like that, that you might have, that is the kind of just sort of sticky, um, loving commitment that doesn't go away that God longs for uh, to have in return because that's the love that he showed us through Jesus. What are some potential difficult experiences as Christians? As in the Israelites case, one might be when we are waiting. Right now we are all in a period of waiting because so many things have changed and continue to change every single day. Another is when something doesn't turn out like we thought that it should. Of course, most of us have been down that road before. When God seems to be absent or isn't answering our prayers, when there is loss, when we feel alone, and when evil seems to triumph. Those are very hard questions and very hard experiences as, as Christians. But even Moses, in spite of all his background, in spite of everything we've talked about, Moses made this decision last week, burning bush, made this decision to stick with God and to show up and to keep that commitment, make that decision to follow him, even when things would be difficult, even when they're in the desert for 40 years. Okay, so all these things are happening down below the mountain, <laughs> right? I can't even envision it. And so in scripture, what it says is the Lord tells Moses and Moses has to scurry down the mountain with, with his buddy, Joshua's helper. The Lord says to Moses, you're not going to believe this. Well, maybe you will, because you kind of know these people by now, but your people, he says, kind of like when you're a parent, your kid, your son, whatever, your people have completely turned away from me at this point. They have made an idol down there, folks, and they're sacrificing to it, and they're throwing a party, and they're worshiping, and whatever. And he says, beyond that, they've just declared this is their God who has delivered them from Egypt. And the Lord's not pleased. He says, Moses, this is obviously my translation. I'm pretty much done. These can be your people. I've kind of had it uh, with these people. And you better get down there and figure out what to do with them because I'm just done. Moses, he hasn't seen any of this yet. And he's just hearing this. He's still on the mountain and he pleads with God to allow these people to live. He loves these people in spite of their, their stuff. And it's kind of funny. He also says this would be a bit of a PR problem for the Lord. Like you just delivered them from Egypt and that was really great. And so then if we were to just, you know, wipe out those people, that might be kind of, you know, why did we, why did you save them, Lord? So he reminds God, in other words, of his covenant with the people. And it says there, God changes his mind. Um, and listens to Moses, which is pretty neat. And so Moses heads down. This is a great part. He heads down to see what God's talking about. Joshua's with him. And on the way, Joshua says, I hear something. It sounds kind of like, you know, fighting or something, but it's actually celebrating. And as they draw closer, Moses cannot believe what he's seeing. And he again feels that, remember, he has a little anger issue. He again feels that, here it comes, even more than before, feels that anger rise up within him. And remember the tablets, like the tablets, it says the Lord had written himself. 
he sees what is going on and he throws the tablets. I don't know if I'd want to do that. Um, but he throws the tablets and they're, they're smashed and he's really angry. And so you can picture this scene. Moses sees this, makes his way through the people. He finds this golden calf. He takes the calf. He probably has some help. He heaves it into the fire and it burns. And with everyone, all the Hebrew people standing around watching this entire display, after it's burned, he's like, Joshua, I'm going to need some help, buddy. And they gather up ashes and then it actually says this, they mix the ashes in with water and they make this drink and they go around to these people and they're like, drink it. And the people drink it. They're stunned by the anger. But th that, is the, um, that is just the amount of passion that Moses has about this. And then Moses still has yet to confront his brother, Aaron. Just as Moses has offered some excuses in the past, it runs in the family a little bit. Aaron has a few excuses of his own. First, he implies it's because this happened because Moses wasn't there. It's like, well, you were up, you know, you were gone a long time. He kind of tries to blame it. It doesn't work. Then he says, they made me do it. You know them. They're really evil. That's the second excuse. This one's the best one. Then he says, all the people, they gave me all this jewelry, and then I melted it and stuff, and I threw it in the fire, and a calf came out. It actually really literally says that. You need to read this chapter because it's pretty great. And all of this, all of this is going to cost the Israelites dearly because then Moses gathers the Levites, and they come, and they end up losing 3,000 people that day. Um, because of all that they've done. And the Lord actually indicates that more punishment will be to come. Now, all of this for them is a gigantic mess. And the point for us is we also are in a gigantic mess when we decide to follow something that is not God, when we erect an idol. Um, the idol might be a person. The idol might be um, an ideology. The idol could be anything. And we all do it, and we're all guilty of that. And Romans 1 talks about um, the difference between creature and creator, and we confuse that. The created with the one who made all of that, and he's the one that we're to be worshiping. So how are we not only uh, to hear from God, but also to know what is, you know, the right thing to do? What are the right decisions to make? And what does God want from us as we follow him? How do we make good choices? Um, how to have that intimate relationship with God. And the first was to make a decision to love God, the father, and what he's done for us in Jesus Christ, and just to commit to him as he has commit to us. And the second answer I gave you last week was to spend time together. Number two is to spend time together. I know this sounds really simple and really basic, um, but I meet Christians all the time. This is a really common question. How do we hear from God? You know, Rachel, I don't get a burning bush. How are we supposed to know what God wants from us? How do we make decisions like that? God doesn't do that for me. Um, you might say. Our faith is actually to impact our daily decisions. I believe that's a little, um, I guess, strange to, to say today, but it's true. That's, that's our whole life. Our faith in God is supposed to impact our daily life and the decisions that each one of us make. And that's one gift of having the Holy Spirit within us as believers in Jesus. Instead, it's hard for us, to, for us to hear from God because we spend a lot of time on the computer or on our phone or watching the news or wrapped up in the politics of the day or whatever it's going to be, and that drowns out everything that we need um, to hear from God. In the Israelites' case, this has disastrous results because nobody's listening and nobody's following, and it does for us too. This is from John chapter eight. Jesus says, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. We have to have knowledge of God's word, knowledge of God from God's word in order to make 
decisions about whom or what to follow. Because everything about God is revealed right there in God's word for us. This is how we measure the decisions we make against something that is true, against truth, rather than some other worldview we've picked out from somewhere else or someone's opinion. We read the Bible, we absorb um, God's word. Here's another verse for you. This is from 2 Corinthians 10, uh, verse 4. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Lots of strongholds right now. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. We as Christians don't fight arguments with weapons of the world, whatever those are. We're believers, and that is to mean something. This is a big deal. Folks are not in their churches. This is a big deal right now. We are believers, and that is to mean something, and we are to abide not in a church building, whatever. This is just a church building. We are to abide in Christ, is what God's word says. The weapon the apostle Paul refers to there is the word of God. We have to have the knowledge of God, and only then can we take captive these thoughts that we have when we're at the bottom of the mountain and we're looking for a leader or direction, take captive our thoughts in order to be obedient to Christ. Only then do we have some kind of measuring stick and some kind of direction. So you might be comfortable with everything goes like whatever is good for you is I'm not okay with that. And I know from God's word that our creator, that the heavenly father, he is not good with that. That is not what it says. Uh, Pastor Nikki Gumbel, he's from Alpha. Some of you are familiar with. He uses an illustration here that really sticks with me, and he tells it much better than I would, so I'm going to be brief. He talks about imagining a soccer game with no rules. And you might have seen, you know, three- or four-year-olds play soccer together. It kind of probably looks a little bit like that. You know, there might still be one soccer ball, and there might be still two teams and two goals. But if there are no rules, if there are no boundary lines, the ball is going everywhere. There are no positions. The ball is out of bounds. People are running all over the field. Of course, we can picture complete chaos because there are no rules. There are no boundaries, and it would be a complete mess. Our knowledge of God, which we receive through the word of God, it does a few things. It informs our decisions like it would of that day at the bottom of the mountain. It allows God to communicate with us and for us to hear from him. It establishes boundaries upon our personal lives, the lives of our, our families, and it shows us how to follow Christ. As the brother of Jesus who was named James, put it, welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. The implanted word. So spend time with God in his word by reading scripture. Don't tell me God doesn't answer prayer or you don't know what to do or there's no burning bush or I have no idea, you know, any of those things without trying this out and doing so over a period of time and making that commitment. We have to spend time together. Remember, that was number two in order to understand and to him and to know what to do and how to follow him in our lives. Okay, now we're on to our third one in the end of uh, this chapter of Moses, at least for today. Number three from last week, this week, is share from the depths of your heart with God. Now, next week, we're going to finish this series up, and uh, it's been fun. And if you have feedback, we'd love to hear it. You can email us about that. We had to skip a lot. Um, so we hope you go back and read because it's just so lengthy. Uh, there was a lot of goodness in there that we actually didn't get to share. So go back and read. And if this caused you to read a little bit more then that's terrific too. But where does this all leave us today? So as we continue reading, this is like the first part of chapter 33 there in Exodus, the Lord's still upset, rightly so. And he indicates that the Israelites are still going to be punished. And we don't, we don't know what that looks like. 
as were with the Israelites that day. But he tells Moses to get on out of Sinai and just to take these people with him and to forge ahead and to continue on to the promised land. And chapter three indicates, this is kind of funny, that they're not wearing ornaments anymore. They're not wearing earrings and rings and stuff anymore. I wonder why. It might be because they're melted into the golden calf <laughs> that everybody had to drink. They're not wearing any of that anymore. They're kind of looking like a sheepish kind of ragged group after all of this craziness that has happened um, in that period of time. In spite of that, when we read in verses following, Moses recommits to loving these people. He does because he meets with God and he actually prays for these people who drive him crazy. It's kind of neat. We can see this transformation that has happened in Moses along the way. And he's also reconnected with and recommitted to God uh, who is helping him to be a leader. And so as they leave the mountain, because he used to go up there and meet with God and all that, he starts instead pitching a tent in order to meet God. He'd go out to the tents outside their camp. And when he would do that and, and talk to him and hear from him, people would come outside their tents and they would stand and kind of observe like, what's the Lord going to say now? Where are we going? What is going to happen? Maybe he takes away our food. I don't know what's going to happen. And they, and they, you know, watch, they can't hear, but they watch and they see him commune with God one-on-one uh, -on -one in that way. And Moses prays for them, talks about them, and um, God communicates back. And it says that Moses and the Lord, they speak together as friends. So share from the depth of your heart with God. Prayer is fundamental to having that kind of closeness or intimacy with God just like any relationship we have in our lives um, with the people that God's created us to be with. Communication is a piece of that and a really important piece of that. Prayer is sharing from our hearts our disappointments, our needs, um, sharing you know, what we want, even our desires. And another piece of that is the praise and worship of God that comes from beginning to recognize in that closer relationship that God's in our daily lives and what he is doing for us and being able to give him our gratitude. There's something more than that too. And it's seeing as Moses did, because he's, he's been through all kinds of things. And there has been a big transformation here in all those chapters um, that we tried to cover that we are enough for God, that Moses was enough for God and that there is so much that he wanted to do through him and that he wants to do through each one of us as well. And it's being able to hear God's direction in prayer for us as we've talked about. So under that number three, if we were to add two parts, we would say part of that intimacy with God, the first one is seeing ourselves in God's story as part of his plan for the world, as part of his plan for redemption, seeing ourselves in God's story. And the second piece of that, if we were to add the number two under there, is seeing God as part of our story and recognizing that he is here and active in our lives in his, uh, God's word says, it is in him that we live and move and have our very being. Amen. Let me pray. Lord God, thank you for these um, colorful and amazing stories in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. We just thank you for your word to us. What a gift that it records all of these things that happened about um, people that are just like us. And that because of your Holy Spirit, uh, we can see that in spite of our weaknesses and our hangups and our um, running away from God and our inability to hear um, from you, uh, that you want to use us and that we are enough in your eyes because of our relationship we have with you through Jesus Christ. So Lord, I pray for each one of us that you give us the desire as Moses had to recommit to you, to recommit to love you, and also to love the ones we are with, the one, others you have created and that um, are part of our lives. 
And we pray that you, you help us to um, read your word because we know that that is a transforming experience because of your Holy Spirit. And again, that it's never, a, it's never an empty experience for us. So thank you for the gift of um, your word because it reveals your son, Jesus Christ, to us. Lord, we continue to pray um, for our loved ones. We pray for all of those listed on our, our prayer list as a church. Lord, we continue to pray for those who are affected by wildfire um, and continue to battle that in our state and in the Northwest. Lord, we pray for those who continue to be affected by this pandemic, by COVID, um, and for all the ramifications of this season of time. Thank you that you are still here with us. And thank you that you are, we are yours. And we pray together in Jesus' name. Amen.
Behold the empty tomb.